Uh, each time uh, uh, we do Bible studies in this, re- this area, we meet to plan. And uh, we sat at uh, Gary and Janet's uh, you know, a kitchen table, and we were planning the Bible, st- the Lent-, Lent studies. And then I said, why don't we do something quite radical just before we begin the Lent? And uh, that's how this idea of uh, Shrove Tuesday was born. Uh, What I did not realize was that because I had had a professor in uh, Sheffield, I thought the the best person who can really come and give that kind of a lecture is Professor Frances Young. But how do I invite her? Will she ever come? You know, that was my difficulty. Uh, and I said, well, the worst she can see is no anyway. So I sent her email, and I was splendidly pleased that she said yes. Uh, Professor Francis Young has many accolades. Published scholar, uh, OBE, has been a dean of the university in, in Birmingham, uh, pr- vice chancellor of Provost, you know. Uh, so she has, she has had it all, and we couldn't have gotten a better person for tonight's lecture. Now, the, tep- the, the topic, she asked me to explain a little bit because uh, I'm guilty of coming up with a, with a topic. I said, Jesus of history and the Christ of faith for today's church. How does the man who walked on the streets of Palestine become the savior of the world? And how do I live that faith today, uh, you know, in in a postmodern secular world? So the man who walked in the streets of Palestine, how does he become the savior of the world, my savior, the Lord, the Messiah, and how do we live that today? Who is a better person to handle that kind of a topic than the professor? Please join me to welcome her. Well, I'm not quite sure what I've planned to say will answer exactly the question as put tonight. But, uh, but we'll have a go. Um, The historical Jesus and the Christ of faith is one of those topics which has been hot for about 200 years. It's a very modern question. And, um, of course, every professor of New Testament has done a whole lecture course on it. So forgive me if I go on too long tonight. I've done my best. Um, The... um, Earlier in church history, of course, people have talked about the humanity and divinity of Christ, or they have talked about the Son of Man and the Son of God, and they have sometimes struggled to hold those together as one Lord Jesus Christ. Um, But the questions were slightly shifted and changed at the time of the so-called Enlightenment and became really hot in the 19th century. And I think you need to understand some of the story which led to these tensions. The Enlightenment began it because some great scholar has suggested what the Enlightenment did was to disenchant the world. People stopped believing in fairies, stopped believing in the supernatural, All of these things gave way to material cause and effect, which could be established and shown through the basic empirical methods of science. And so, you know, it wasn't so easy to hold together the supernatural, if you like, that you find in the gospel story and the fact that Jesus was a real human being who lived a real human life. And eventually these questions really came up to the fore. And people wanted to know what lay behind the Gospels. 
Um, well, they, back in those days, may have believed in, um, you know, uh, evil spirits who possessed people. But we don't think like that anymore. I mean, we would call the possession by evil spirits mental illness, for example. And so, what really happened? Can we reconstruct the Jesus of history from the evidence? Can we explain how and why extraordinary beliefs about him emerged? How do we explain the Christian faith? And so people got engaged in what I will call detective work. They believed that there was a difference between fact and interpretation, and you have to strip away the interpretation to try and get at the facts. And, well, in the process, it was very easy to lose faith, wasn't it? Now, I think there are one or two key things in this story which it's worth understanding. The first thing which really caused a great scandal in the middle of the 19th century was a German scholar called Reimarus, whose real views didn't really emerge until after his death. Uh, but he pointed out the discontinuity between the message of Jesus and the message of the apostles. Jesus was preaching and teaching about the kingdom of God. The apostles were preaching and teaching about Jesus, for heaven's sake. And he drew some highly skeptical conclusions that actually all the great Christian doctrines like Trinity and Atonement and all this, they were all the invention of the apostles and those who came later. Uh, Jesus didn't claim any of those things. The truth is that this is now generally accepted by historians and scholars of the New Testament and early Christianity. Jesus did not present himself. He didn't preach himself. He didn't claim to be Messiah or Christ or Son of God. He pointed away from himself to God the Father and to the kingdom of God. Jesus was a Jew. He was a Jew who upheld the law and, like other rabbis all down the centuries, debated it and came up with certain radical conclusions which other Jews at the time didn't like, often called the scribes and Pharisees in our gospel stories. And Jesus didn't preach to Gentiles. There were a few Gentiles few stories. They had to dig deep for these few stories about his meeting with Gentiles in Palestine. Um, whereas the apostles very rapidly took the message around the whole Roman world preaching to Gentiles. And at the root of this fundamental difference is the recognition that particularly in the first gospel to be written, Mark, we find what is called the messianic secret. You know, time and again, Jesus says, don't go telling people about this. Shut up, you know. And the disciples are always sort of asking. They don't understand him, and they're asking what's going on, and they're not sure. And, and so deep in the gospel tradition, there is this messianic secret. And so one of the first things about the historical Jesus, the Jesus of history, is you have to, as it were, strip away Christian belief systems to get back to what lies behind them. So that's one big issue. Now, the second issue came up with someone called Strauss in the mid-19th century. Uh, some of you may know the novelist George Eliot from that time. Now, she, she was, of course, a she, um, she got into hot water because she translated the work of this German scholar Strauss into English. And the argument of Strauss was that you can't strip away the myth around Jesus. The whole story is saturated with myth. And the myth and the history is so intertwined, you can't sort it out. Now, that was far too radical for the mid-19th century, I can tell you. And it was still too radical 
in the mid-20th century when some of us were involved in a notorious volume called The Myth of God Incarnate. Um, now, what happened in the 19th century was people resisted this. And they said, yes, we can sort this out. We can see what is myth, and we can search for what lies behind these ways of talking and the way they used to think. And we can have this search for what's really authentic, and we can find the authentic teaching of Jesus. And so the 19th century, to point with a very broad brush, came up with a picture of Jesus as a great teacher, a great moral and spiritual teacher, who taught the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. Yes, sorry, ladies, it was the brotherhood of man in the 19th century. Um, for example, Jesus was conceived of as the truly God-conscious person who showed the way for all the rest of us to live. Well, then, um, some of you probably came across Albert Schweitzer in Sunday school. I certainly did. You know, this great hero going to Africa with his medical missions and all that. Well, he wrote a book absolutely tearing all that apart because he said, you're just looking down the wrong way down a looking glass, a, a telescope, and you're seeing your own face at the bottom of a deep well. You know, this ideal Jesus was the ideal 19th century gentleman. And so he said, actually, Jesus comes to us as one unknown. He's a stranger. He comes from a strange world. And he said that... Um, Jesus was a prophet of the end of the world. His predictions were not fulfilled, and he died disillusioned. But he still went to be that great hero of medical missionary, didn't he? Mm -hmm. um, so it is now generally agreed that all that end of the world stuff is actually the cultural context in which Jesus was operating. Apocalyptic, apocalypses, you have two examples in the Bible. One is the book of Daniel, and the other is the book of Revelation, a Christian version of an apocalypse. There were many apocalypses written in the period between the two testaments. And lots of people were living with this concept of God and the power of evil being locked in cosmic conflict and ultimately God would triumph and there would be the end of the world and there would be the final judgment and all of that. That's a context in which a lot of people were thinking and there is absolutely no doubt that the whole of the New Testament is colored by the hopes that Jesus somehow was bringing about this final denouement. And this leaves very serious questions for us about how to translate such ideas into things that make sense to us. In the mid-20th century, there was another notorious German scholar called Bultmann who talked about demythologizing, and he tried to translate the language of the Gospels into the language of existentialist philosophy. Um, but, as Strauss already said in the mid-19th century, the things are so intertwined in the New Testament. How do we actually get to grips with something we can understand and something which is true to the Jesus of history who belonged to those times. So now we we'll move to another whole area, which is, of course, the source material. If you're engaged in detective work, you have to look at all the evidence and you have to examine the nature of the evidence. And we have four Gospels, and some people in the early church were worried about the fact there were four, and some people to this very day are worried about the fact that they're not all the same. 
And so what you do with four different Gospels, first of all, you observe that John's Gospel is radically different from the other three. You've noticed this, I hope. Yes. And um, they are so different because think of all the parables in what we call the synoptic Gospels because you can see them together. Synoptic, see them together. Um, the parables in those Gospels. You don't have parables like that anywhere in John's Gospel, do you? And there are a few overlapping stories. But when you think about something like the Sermon on the Mount, which looks like a collection of lots of different proverbs and sayings and words of wisdom, doesn't it? All sort of built up around themes. Uh, and you look at John's Gospel, you have Jesus getting into disputes with people, about all kinds of things and then you have those what we call the farewell discourses where he develops the idea about the, the vine and all of these things you know it's not a bit the same is it as the sort of teaching you find in the other gospels so John is put on one side John increasingly is treated as the reflections of Christians about the significance of Jesus and his teaching. Yes, there are, the roots of it are there. Some of the same sayings trigger off the discourses. Some references to scripture trigger off the discourses, just like many references to scripture in the other Gospels. So you've got this, this difference. Um, one of my teachers at university uh, wrote a commentary on John in which he suggested that it's a series of sermons on texts taken from the other Gospels. Well, let's, anyway, let's put that to one side for a moment. And what, what's going on in the synoptics? You see, they are too alike. They go over the same ground, don't they? So which was the first? And who's copying who? Well, it, research, intensive research, has suggested that Mark is the common thing in all three Gospels. So Mark was the first, and whoever wrote Matthew and Luke, I mean, we could discuss that for a very long time, um, they actually copied Mark, but they fitted in other material and shaped it differently and overall have a slightly different story to tell. They're giving a, a different portrait, if you like. And then, of course, the stuff in Matthew, which isn't in Luke, and the stuff in Luke that isn't in Matthew, but there is stuff in Matthew and Luke which is not in Mark. So there is this hypothetical source called Q, which Luke and Matthew copied, okay? and wove in with Mark. And then, well, Matthew has the wise men, and Luke has the shepherds. They're, they're quite different. So, so they have other material which the other didn't have. And so you get back to a series of interlinked source materials, and you say they're not independent witnesses, and yet you can discern what might be independent witnesses, and, and you discover that the Gospels are compendia, which are each drawn up by somebody to present a particular understanding of who Jesus was. And all this is done well after the death and resurrection of Jesus. So all of that becomes the climax of the story and colors the way they look back at what happened before. And trying to unpick all of that is part of, you know, the Christ of faith being thoroughly mixed up with the Jesus of history. And then there is the so-called oral period. Another thing Bultmann, the great 20th century scholar, did was to try and discern the different forms in which the things were passed down in the oral tradition. Because, well, think of the Lord's Prayer. If anybody tries to change it in nonconformist churches that don't have written liturgies, it's very difficult. 
isn't it? We all stay, still say the these and thys and all that because that's what we grew up with. If you're a liturgical church with a modern, updated, uh, not Book of Common Prayer, but something else, then you can change the wording, can't you? And update it. In oral tradition, people are working with their memories. And so that the stories took particular forms and were uh, passed down from one person to another in particular forms, and the same with the sayings. And could we analyze this oral period before anything was written down? Well, you get the point. Um, it takes a lot of detailed discussion and research to try and get back to what might be authentic. And do remember, the Gospels are written in Greek, and Jesus spoke in Aramaic. So, how do we get back to what might be authentic? Bultmann said, hardly anything in the Gospels can be proved to be genuine. Okay? So, now another area to look at. There has, of course, been intensive research in ancient sources to reconstruct the cultural background, to explore things like the apocalypses, to discover that there were many different Jewish groups with different views in this time. In fact, the Judaism of the rabbis, which has been passed down to this day, uh, was not actually around at that time, though the Pharisees may have been the ancestors of the rabbis who formed Judaism about a hundred years later. So there are different... Uh, and then you find the Dead Sea Scrolls emerge, and a completely different new group of Jews who had a particular outlook appear uh, that uh, we didn't know about before, except they might be the Essenes that we find in some ancient sources and so on. So th there was a huge amount of industry in looking at the, the different cultural forms, the ways people thought, the language they used, in order to try and understand what was going on. Now people began to devise criteria to distinguish what might be original to Jesus rather than just being what you find in the culture around. And the Jesus Seminar, of which you may have heard, operated for a while in the US in the late 20th century, and they were examining every single thing in the Gospels and trying to determine, by using these criteria, how authentic it might be. Now, one criterion was multiple attestation. That meant that you find it in the different sources. So the different sources confirm one another. And to the sources I've mentioned, which is Mark and Q, and the special material of Matthew and Luke, and so on, we must add some things in the epistles of Paul, because the Pauline epistles are our earliest, our earliest Christian documents. So if you find them in these different strands, then it looks as though you might be getting somewhere. And then another criterion was to say, well, it's neither like anything we find in contemporary Judaism, nor is it like anything that we find in the early church. Therefore, it must be Jesus. Okay? Because if it comes from the early church, it could be the apostles and so on. And if it comes from the culture around, then how do we know it's original to Jesus? Well, you can see that these are not going to produce very much. And it, if you're not careful, you take Jesus out of his own context. Surely Jesus is going to say things that other people are saying in his own time. And then there is the criterion of coherence, that when you've actually managed to find this little bit of authentic teaching, then you can add things that are coherent with it and expand it a little bit. And then people realize, well, you know, all of this 
isn't really getting us anywhere. So we'll have the criterion of historical plausibility. Okay? <laughs> so I can tell you in the, in the late 20th century, we had endless books about the Jesus of history. And he appears as a prophet of the end time, as a Jewish holy man, as a rabbi, as a Pharisee, yeah, there's a lot in common between Jesus and the Pharisees, as a Galilean peasant, as a cynic philosopher, well, that's a big story, <laughs> as a social revolutionary, as a sage, seer, wise man, and, of course, Tom Wright has been arguing like fun that he was the true Messiah, after all. So, has the quest for the historical Jesus reached a dead end? Are there too many known unknowns, let alone the unknown unknowns? And certainly, I suggest that the questions are more important than the answers because they get you thinking and wondering and pursuing and researching. But just think about it. No historical reconstruction of anything is ever definitive. You're always assessing probabilities. Always assessing probabilities. And even of modern events, you get different books written with different interpretations of the significance of what's happened. So it won't be surprising if you find, in fact, it's even more likely with things that are 2,000 years old. So Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate. That is very highly probable, if not definite. Okay? Um, but why? Why was Jesus crucified? Even if you're asking the historical question, you immediately get into debate. Because crucifixion was a Roman punishment. But the Gospels give us the impression it was the Jewish authorities who wanted to get rid of Jesus. So what's going on? What's going on? Why was Jesus crucified? What was the charge against him? And I can tell you, I could give you a whole lecture on that. It's a very complex question when you're trying to look into the historical evidence that we have. Now, why then is all of this important for today's church? One thing that I think is of fundamental importance is the recognition that Jesus was a Jew. You know, in Sunday school, you have pictures of Jesus with fair hair and blue eyes. Please tear them down and tear them up. Jesus was a first century Jew. He had a particular historical life in a particular historical period. And so he was other than us although he was one of us as a human being. And the diversity of human being and human culture is something really fundamentally important to recognize in our society today. Jesus was a Jew with a particular historical life. We can't make him what we like. But... We have to also to affirm, as the early church did time and again, that he was truly human. He's not some sort of angel in disguise. They had to keep arguing that. He was truly human. Tried and tested and tempted in all points as we are, says the epistle to the Hebrews. And the second important point is we need to realize that the Gospels are not biographies in the modern sense. Modern biographies always seek to uncover the facts. They are in this detective mode. 
Oh yes, they do talk about significance and all that as well, and they make assessments and judgments about the particular person, but there's a tendency for people to be self-conscious about the difference between fact and interpretation. The Gospels are not like that. The Gospels are, um, they have this, this interpretation, this uh, assessment, this seeking for significance, all intertwined with the stories and the reports of the teaching. They are portraits, not photographs, if you get what I mean by that. They carry the interpretation with it. They're not just straight representations. And so I'd like to introduce you to more recent approaches, um, notably in a massive book, by the way, by the New Testament scholar Jimmy Dunn, J.D.G. Dunn, who was professor in Durham, and it's called Jesus Remembered. Jesus Remembered. And he argues that Jesus is only perceived now through the impact he had on the disciples. And there's no way we can get round that. What we need to do is to read the Gospels as testimony to what the disciples discerned in Jesus. And then I've done a bit of exploration as to how the Gospels were understood in the second century. So, you know, a generation or two late after they were written. And the first thing to note is they were called memoirs of the apostles. Memoirs. The other thing is that these memoirs were not yet completely tied to four gospels that were meticulously copied. You know, there's no printing back in those days, so they're all copied by hand. Um, and you get texts meticulously copied uh, when they get fixed. But in the second century, it's clear, there was a lot of gospel material floating around on bits and pieces of papyrus and whatever. And you've got some stories which even to this day, we're not quite sure where they belong in the gospel tradition because they appear in different manuscripts in different places. And in the second century, it's quite clear there, were, there was lots of gospel material floating around but the most important thing is they were for liturgical use. They were treated as episodes. They were read piecemeal, just as they are to this day in church. Because you don't read a whole gospel, do you? You read sections of gospels. And so they're episodic. And they're meant to teach people something about how they should live or they're meant to teach people something about who Jesus is and what he's done. Devotion and doctrine surround these episodic piecemeal stories which are being used in the worship of the church in the second century. So the whole idea of the quest that you somehow separate these things out is, is just not quite true to the nature of the material. And then think about it. Your memory is selective, isn't it? I mean... <laughs> if you were telling somebody about your day, you wouldn't start off by saying, um, well, I got out of bed and I staggered to the bathroom. And I went downstairs and um, looked for my breakfast. Um, you know, you don't actually give a blow-by-blow -blow account of everything that happens to you. Get that? You select what is significant in your day. And so if they're memoirs, there is bound to be a process of selecting what is seen to be significant and important for understanding who this person is. It's what's striking, what's unusual, what's significant that goes into the process of interpretation. And yet, and yet they were sure in the second century that there were real happenings around the life and teaching of Jesus. 
and that Jesus really did die and was risen again. And it was not some angel in disguise who came down and lived among men for a bit and then disappeared before the crucifixion, which is what some people came up with in the second century. No, the, the tradition of the church was clear from the beginning that Jesus was a real human being who somehow was an icon, an image, a representation in human form of the one true God of all. Now the quest, it sought to get back to eyewitnesses, like the police trying to reconstruct after a road accident. But significance is usually discerned later by hindsight. And the significance of Jesus is only discerned by looking back through the final thing, the cross and the resurrection. And that's the importance of the testimony of the gospel writers. First the apostles, then those who passed on the stories, then those who gathered them together in the gospels. They are giving testimony. They are offering memories of the impact that Jesus has had on them. And this is to be seen in the light of the cross and the resurrection. This meaning and significance is particularly seen through looking at the scriptures and discovering how they are somehow mirroring what was going to happen in the life of Jesus. And discovering the meaning of what happened in the life of Jesus through scripture and at the same time discovering new meaning in scripture because of what happened in Jesus. The two things work against one another, with one another, alongside one another. So I was thinking I might share with you a possible reading of Jesus Christ for today's church, drawing on these memoirs and their resonances with the scriptures. Um, but it might take a little while yet, and I don't know uh, whether you really want to listen to me for another 15 minutes on this. You do? You want me to carry on? <laughs> okay. I'm going to take a slightly unusual thing as my clue, my starting point, from John's Gospel, because I think John's Gospel can throw some very important light on what's going on. In chapter 5, Jesus claims to do nothing of himself, but simply to work the works of the Father. In the other Gospels, as I've said, this characteristic is captured in the so-called messianic secret and in the stumbling way in which disciples come to discern who Jesus is. The story of Peter's confession, you know, when Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter turns around and says, you're the Christ. And then... Um, when Jesus starts talking about going to the cross, Peter says, oh, no, 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 no. And Jesus turns in and says, get thee behind me, Satan. Do you remember that one? And um, what's happening is that Jesus is challenging the disciples to, to um, see this messiahship in a different light and to see his vocation as... Um, he, he has already rejected the temptation to uh, be self-serving, to seek power and all that. Think of the temptation stories. And in the fourth gospel, we're told that the people tried to take Jesus by force and make him king, but he quietly withdrew, so they couldn't do it. It's uh, the, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Well, you know, if he was going to be the Messiah people expected, he'd have been on a war horse and we'd be threatening to drive the Romans out and all that. But actually, he came humble and riding on a donkey. And they even found a scriptural text in the prophets to show that was what the Messiah should really be like. The early Christians universally called him Christ. Christos is a Greek word meaning anointed one. 
Messiah is the Hebrew equivalent. And so they called him the Messiah, affirming that despite his humility and rejection, he was indeed the one promised in Scripture, the anointed king in David's line. And his royalty is paradoxically seen in avoiding any of royalty's normal trappings. He never takes power or control, but pursues the vocation which he discerned in the scriptures to be a servant king, identified with the poor and the outcast, to accept the persecution and suffering which, according to the scriptures, attends the servants of God and above all, to demonstrate through absolute trust in God that true righteousness transcends both the self-concern and the hypocrisy by which its pursuit is so often infected. God's kingdom is his one focus, not his own role or position. To preach the kingdom of God, it seems, involves decentering one's own inclinations, interests, or even identity, and invoking an upside-down world where the people blessed are the poor, those who mourn, the meek, the merciful, those who really care about righteousness, purity of heart, and peace, and are persecuted for their commitment. I hope you recognize the Beatitudes behind that. To deny oneself means giving attention to others, not because they satisfy your own need for friendship or recognition, but because God sends rain on just and unjust alike. Those that the world excludes, denigrates or fears, the mad, those with disabilities, lepers, the sick, women and children, Samaritans and Gentiles, enemies and aliens, Even the wicked and the demon-possessed, such people are to be welcomed, eaten with, and listened to, for not even a sparrow falls apart from your father. As remembered in the gospel traditions, Jesus, through words, parables, signs, and actions, subverts every identity claim in the name of the one God, creator and father of all. And Paul, in the earliest Christian writings we possess, does the same. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, he writes. As the climax of an argument in which Abraham is claimed as the father of many nations. Indeed, from John the Baptist through Paul and into the Gospels, the Jews are denied exclusive claim to their ancestor because scripture said he was to be the father of many nations. To see that God's mercy embraces all of creation is to be led beyond the barriers which human beings create between one another and to signpost the possibility that people can relate across difference without violence and defensiveness, blaming and shaming, prejudice and bigotry, aggression, competition, and destructive rivalry. Jesus was not alone in summing up God's law in two commandments, love God and love your neighbor. You find that in the rabbinic literature. But Jesus added, love your enemies. Paul, again, provides some confirmation, for he too summed up the law in terms of the love of God and love of neighbor and celebrated what that means in a poem about love which has often been recognized as effectively a portrait of Jesus. I refer to 1 Corinthians 13. You all know it, don't you? Off by heart, I hope. Christianity has never been tried, they say. Certainly, the followers of Jesus have hardly lived up to what comes across as lying at the heart of what Jesus was about. Struggling with his congregations, Paul, time and again, reveals that he has grasped the radical critique Jesus has offered to the ways of the world, even the temptation to put the world to rights by using power and control has to be set aside. 
Jesus makes God's kingship surprising and potentially already present. It asks for loyalty and obedience, but not enforced submission. Rather, it's an invitation to repent. Metanoia. It means change your mind. It means turn around the whole perspective and approach. It means to receive grace, to rediscover the call to be God's offspring, creatures made in God's image, perfect as the Father in heaven is perfect. It's a summons to live in trust, to consider the lilies and the ravens and be anxious for nothing. God is discerned in the everyday, in trees and fruit, birds and sheep, salt and light, builders and sowers, masters and servants, wedding feasts and business dealings. What Jesus presented was the challenge to live in the light of the coming kingdom, this God-focused and God-shaped manner of living, Jesus himself embodied, defining what righteousness really is. So how is it that the Gospels, in the Gospels, this apparently innocuous message is overshadowed by the dominance of the passion narratives? The death of Jesus is the most historically certain thing about him, and yet it's so often been seen as a mark of the failure of his mission. The New Testament itself admits it was a scandal, a stumbling block. Now I want my first picture, if it'll come up. The earliest extant depiction of the crucifixion is a mocking caricature, a graffito depicting a crucified ass. Can you see it? And uh, the inscription reads in Greek, Alex Samanos worships his God. Yet for creeds and gospel writers alike, the passion story becomes the climax and centerpiece. How might this be read? And is it possible to trace what Jesus might have made of this outcome of his mission? In the account I've offered, Jesus appears as one who aligned himself completely with God's purposes by rereading what the scriptures were about. But this constantly divided people. It attracted, it repelled, it exposed what was really in people's hearts. Hypocrisy and outward conformity were challenged. Vested interests confronted. People with influence made to feel uncomfortable. To break the Sabbath, disregard purity regulations, eat with sinners and tax gatherers, challenge what went on in the temple, all in the name of God's deeper demands, was bound to court opposition. A prophet is not acceptable in his own country. Jesus surely died as a messianic pretender, and he wasn't the only one in this period to attract followers who hoped for the restoration of the glory days of King David. A few decades later, the Roman authorities would root out everybody who could claim Davidic descent in an effort to prevent further demonstration, freedom fighting, and insurrection. So there is supreme irony in the prophecy attributed to the high priest Caiaphas in John's Gospel. It is better for you to have one man die for the people than to have the whole nation destroyed. The Jewish authorities are remembered in the Gospels as quite willing so as to get the Roman authorities off their backs to exaggerate the messianic overtones of what Jesus was up to. And the charge posted on the cross was King of the Jews. And the soldiers indulged in mocking horseplay inspired by the apparently ridiculous nature of his claims. Readings which make Jesus just a prophet, a sage, a holy man, or a philosopher cannot fully account for his politically motivated condemnation, nor for the political implications 
of the Latinate name of his followers, Christianoi. Christianoi, that ending, Arnoi, is always used for a political faction, like Toriarnoi, or something like that. <laughs> the challenge of both the teaching and the person of Jesus to let one's life be ruled by God alone and entirely meant potential conflict with both religious and political authorities who sensed their power challenged. It's hardly surprising that Jesus would see himself in the line of the prophets and servants of God who suffered rejection, especially in the light of what happened to John the Baptist. He could well have recognized and predicted his destiny from reading the signs of the times. Martyrdom was already celebrated in stories from the Maccabean period. And indeed, the Maccabean martyrs who had died as Jews under the Greek king Antiochus Epiphanes about two to three hundred years earlier, already the language of sacrifice was being used of their martyrdom. So it's possible that Jesus could have envisaged as the supreme offering, the supreme sacrifice, fulfilling all he was called to be and to do, was going was his obedience even unto death. It's probably captured in the stories of what he did at Passover time on the night in which he was betrayed, that the sacrificial death of Christ constituted a new Passover and the sealing of a new covenant was already apparent to Paul and it's written into the accounts he and the gospel writers provide of a meal which was called recalled in commemorative liturgy. Do this in remembrance of me, was remembered as his dying wish. So is it surprising that Jesus became the center of Christian preaching and devotion and his teaching of the kingdom of God was not so much at the forefront? What are we to make of resurrection stories? On the one hand, they challenge an apocalyptic reading of the gospel story. For no apocalypse envisaged an individual resurrection ahead of the general resurrection of all humankind to face God's judgment at the end of time. There was no idea that the Messiah would rise from the dead. On the other hand, these stories clearly belong to that apocalyptic thought world and whatever actually happened the world colors that world colors not only the gospels but also a great deal of early christian literature the cosmic struggle between god and satan provide an explanatory backcloth for the conflict and persecution faced by jesus and his followers and they began to see the whole thing in terms of a cosmic story from beginning to end so that Jesus reversed the fall of Adam. Is it possible to refresh the reading of these ancient cultural codes, strange and often incredible as they are to people today? In a way, in a, in a way that's exactly what I hope my rereading of Jesus was trying to do. For the dark truth is that the world and its values resist the transformative reality of a life entirely God-focused. Yet if God be God, such a life will ultimately be vindicated. In this kind of a way, the Gospels can become four complementary portraits of this Jesus, both a figure of history and the focus of faith, sketches which bring out profound truths about the human condition, profiles to be read contemplatively, indeed icons or images which draw us into their strange perspective and allow us to discern a transcendent dimension. There never will be a definitive biography. All attempts at a unified account will always fail to replace the four Gospels identified as the memoirs of the Apostles. Maybe no reader can read the Gospels properly 
until she has touched the hem of his garment and been healed. Yet it is by rereading the Gospels that Jesus can be reread time and again for today's church. And the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith put back together, inseparable as they are in the testimony of the Gospels. Now again, I'm going to ask you, do you want me to stop? But I have, you know, Methodists have this tradition of testimony. And the important thing is that the Apostles' testimony has been renewed uh, generation after generation after generation. And so maybe I could finish with a little bit of testimony. Um, And we'll have a picture, please. Next picture. Um, I, thinking about all of these things and pondering it, I thought, how can one see a face of Jesus which isn't, you know, fair hair and blue eyes and all that? And the first thing that struck me was this painting by El Greco, um, where I think you've got a true Mediterranean face. And you can begin to see that um, it'd be more like that, that you should imagine Jesus. And this is Jesus going to the cross. And I had many years when I struggled with faith because of the birth of my son, Arthur, who was born with very profound learning disabilities. It was a very considerable challenge. And my way back into faith began with the cross, where in John's Gospel, I think you can see a picture a portrait of Jesus entering into the very deepest darkness of our human experience. All the gone wrongness, the sin and the suffering, he enters into and transforms into glory. Glory is a really important word in John's Gospel. And this picture represents the Mediterranean Jesus who shoulders the cross and enters into the deepest darkness on our behalf. If we go on to the next picture, I've long been in contact with Jean Vanier, who founded the Lash Communities, where people live in community with those with learning disabilities. And uh, I was, uh, on one occasion, uh, invited to go to Moscow to meet up with people in Russia associated with the L'Arche communities and the Faith and Light movement, which is linked with it. And um, it, I had a, a, a wonderful uh, period of celebration with them for their 20th anniversary. And what I found was that all the groups had this icon. It's one of the earliest icons in existence. It comes from Egypt, it's Coptic, and it's an icon of a saint, St. Minas, who died as a martyr, But the thing is, look at the hand of Jesus on his shoulder. Can you see the fingers? He's got his arm right round him. And there's a long tradition of St. Minas being the friend of Jesus. And all these people in Russia with learning disabilities related to this, Jesus is my friend. Jesus is my friend. And this... The the remarkable thing was, uh, by the end of this, I said I I would really love to take one of those icons home with me. And um, my friend said, oh, no problem. We we just download them from the internet and stick them on cardboard. (laughs) (laughs) And then a third picture. Um... Jean Vanier, uh, in his work on John's Gospel, hazards the suggestion that Lazarus might have been a person with learning disabilities. He gives various reasons, like why is it the house of Martha and Mary if there's a chap around, you know? Um, And um, there is uh, special words in John's Gospel about a very special love with Lazarus. He's the first one in the Gospel where it's said that Jesus specially loved him. And some of you may know about the the very special kind of love that uh, evolves 
with people with learning disabilities, perhaps particularly with those with Down syndrome. And um, so this idea that Jesus, uh, that Lazarus might have been a person with learning disabilities has, has lived with me for a, a long time. And um, it so happened I was asked to go and uh, speak in Sweden at a weekend retreat um, some years ago, just at the point where we were having to make the decision that our son should leave home. We'd cared for him for 45 years and go into residential care. And I found this very distressing, very difficult. And in Sweden, uh, they had a chapel at the top of this building where the retreat was held. And it was absolutely full of icons. And I went up for evening prayers, and they were all praying in Swedish, and I hadn't a clue what was going on. Uh, but I found myself just staring at all these icons. And, and this was one of them. It's an icon of the raising of Lazarus. And um, it's, a, again, in the Coptic tradition. And the first thing was my total identification with the women, the body language of the women, the distress, the pleading with Jesus. And then um, there's the little adult with the mustache. Um, my son is very small, uh, although an adult, now 50 years old, and he has a mustache. And the grave clothes are just like swaddling bands that you see in nativity icons. So I identified with Lazarus as my son with learning disabilities. And then I realized the women couldn't see what Jesus was doing. And I thought, how do I know what Jesus is doing with my Arthur behind my back? And somehow that icon allowed the release and the recovery from the distress of that moment of letting go. So through those pictures, I give testimony to the Christ of faith, who is also the Jesus of history. Thank you.